For those of you who may not know me, my name is John Carter, and I'm professor of political science here at uh, Central Methodist University. And um, today we are gathered together to uh, uh, celebrate the uh, 225th anniversary of the signing of the United States Constitution. Uh, although the Constitution was actually signed on September 17th, okay, so we're a little early, but uh, within the confines of the Friday Forum, this is about as close as I could, uh, could get. The Department of Education actually gives us a couple of weeks of leeway, one week on either side of the, of the anniversary during which to hold our, our event. Um, can you all hear me okay? Anyone not hear me? That's the correct way to. Okay, good. Uh, I'm not using a. I'm not using a microphone today because I am being technologically recorded uh, on a couple of different levels. There's going to be a YouTube video. I'm told. Uh, of this presentation, and we're also apparently going out. Is it live or is it recorded? Recorded. Oh, good. Uh, in case I say, in case I say something foolish, that's always worthwhile. Uh, uh, over the uh, CMU radio station. So, um, if you if you find what we say here memorable. You can relive it as many times as you'd like, I think. But anyway, uh, the, um, the point of the presentation today, obviously, is to commemorate uh, the uh, anniversary of the signing of the United States Constitution. Um, and that, in and of itself, is, is ample cause for, uh, for celebration. It's also, in, in the case of, of Central's event, uh, it's also uh, one that's intended to be uh, at least mildly educational uh, for, for the audience, I hope. That's my, that's my goal. And so, uh, I, uh, when planning these kinds of events, I think it's always tempting for speakers to be drawn into contemporary affairs, especially in a presidential election year, uh, you know, and so I'm not going to do that. Uh, if you'd like to talk about contemporary politics, my door is always open. I'm, you know, always interested in the unfolding of uh, contemporary uh, politics. But this summer, as I was preparing for this presentation, it occurred to me that in the, I don't want to call it the aftermath because that's kind of negative, but in the, in the sort of the afterglow of the uh, Citizens United decision regarding uh, campaign finance uh, contribution limits, you know, that, that uh, uh, the United States Supreme Court handed down uh, recently, and in light of the national health insurance decision from this summer uh, upholding the uh, uh, recently enacted, relatively recently enacted national uh, health insurance program program, that there was a lot of talk uh, among analysts about how best to understand the American Constitution. How should we best understand the American Constitution? And of course, depending on whether they agreed with the decisions or of the Supreme Court of the United States or opposed the you know, outcome of those decisions, the commentators you know, would usually spin their analysis uh, accordingly. And I thought that uh, that might be a useful segue, you know, in a presidential election year, since obviously people are thinking about the impact of these decisions. We're going to spend, uh, I say we Americans, are going to witness the spending of about four billion dollars on a presidential election cycle by the time we're done in November. Uh, that's that's going to touch each and every one of us, uh, no matter who wins, you know, or how this thing comes out. That's going to change politics uh, as we roll out the National Health Insurance Act over the coming couple of years. We're all going to be affected in some way by you know that decision. So I thought that in you know those uh, those events might make a useful segue to approach the question, the question of how best to interpret the Constitution. I think in the heat of the moment, analysts, you know, in the wake of some decision like the ones I just uh, noted, invariably they, uh, oops, I invariably they tend to argue that um, either a mistake has been made or a great new constitutional reality has finally been realized, but their, you know, their discussion is always, um, as uh, 
Speaker Tip O'Neill said, always uh, can be understood as, you know, a sort of an extension of where they sit. O'Neill's famous for saying, where you stand on an issue depends on where you sit. <laughs> From his vantage point at the head of the House of Representatives, you know, the Democrats sit on one side, the Republicans sit on the other side of the House. And so uh, he, was, he was playing a, a little word game with us. But, so I, what I thought was that I, would, I wanted to illustrate that this debate about how best to extract the meaning of the Constitution is neither new nor is the answer to it obvious. Because I, th I think that as the debate focuses in on some contemporary event, the proponents on both sides always argue that, you know, obviously their opponents are wrong and the fact that they're wrong is should be obvious to everyone. Uh, and uh, so I thought we'd go back in time uh, to Marbury versus Madison. That's a case that I begin my constitutional law class with. I think most constitutional law classes in the United States probably begin uh, with Marbury versus Madison. It's a very early 1803 United States Supreme Court case uh, involving presidential appointments. Uh, in order, and, and I want to I want to use it as an illustration of how this this debate about the correct way to extract the meaning of the Constitution is as old as the Republic itself, uh, and opaque for the same reason. Um, to set the, to set the uh, stage, the Judiciary Act of 1789, Constitution is signed in 1787. The Judiciary Act of 1789 comes almost immediately after enough states have ratified the Constitution for the new government to go into effect. Uh, and uh, you will know, of course, from your reading of uh, article, what article is that that sets up the conditions under which the Constitution will go into effect? Article 7 yeah, says that when nine states have ratified, the Constitution will go into effect, the new government will be formed, elections will be held, and things will start to happen. It, it was a political feint in the sense that they were trying to create pressure on the states they thought might be reluctant to ratify, okay, so that they wouldn't be left, they would be concerned not to be left behind. So the Judiciary Act is actually passed before all of the states have had an opportunity to select their representatives and actually begin to participate uh, in, the, uh, in the government. Uh, the Judiciary Act of 1789 was necessary because the Constitution says basically almost nothing about the organization of the United States Judiciary. It says there will be a Supreme Court, that Supreme Court judges will be appointed by the President subject to the advice and consent of the Senate and it says that there shall be such other courts as Congress may from time to time deem appropriate or necessary. So we began, you know, with the new government with just the one court. Uh, who knows who the first Chief Justice was? Marshall? No. Actually he was the fourth. Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. There was a lot of turnover in the early days because nobody could figure out exactly what the Supreme Court was supposed to do. Uh, probably the most famous of the early uh, Chief Justices was a fellow named John Jay. Jay's an interesting character because he, he has as good a claim as George Washington to being first president of the United States. He was the president of the legislature under the Articles of Confederation before the Constitution was written. And so his title was President of the United States. Uh, although it was under a different system of government, Jay would go on to uh, serve as George Washington's uh, first Secretary of State at the same time that he served as Chief Justice. There's no prohibition in Article 3 from federal judges serving in, uh, in the executive branch at the same time. So, but in any case, the Judiciary Act was necessary because there had to be some filling in of the gaps in terms of the creation of a, of a judiciary. The framers had worked very quickly and they'd left out most of the details about how the court system might actually you know, be composed and work. Uh, the Judiciary Act of 1789 created Justice of the Peace judgeships for the District of Columbia. The District of Columbia was territory that Maryland gave to the national government uh, that nobody wanted. I mean, that's why they gave it to the national government. Uh, it was a swamp, it was mosquito infested, and there was a malaria problem. Uh, 
Uh, if you spend the summer in Washington, D.C., you can sort of still see the traces of that, uh, of that problem there, although the malaria is pretty much under control. Uh, but, the, uh, but the idea was that it was national government territory, so no state courts had jurisdiction in the District of Columbia. So it was necessary to have some local courts. And so the Judiciary Act of 1789 created justice of the peace judgeships uh, as federal courts, but local federal courts. You know, like police courts, uh, what we would think of, you know, on a municipal level. Uh, the act also gave the Supreme Court the power of the writ of mandamus, uh, which is an original jurisdiction power to issue orders to uh, government officials instructing them to carry out duties that they have neglected to carry out. That's a, a special sort of judicial order that's not in Article 3 of the Constitution. Okay. And uh, sh followed shortly by the Judiciary Act of 1801, uh, which further fleshes out the judiciary. It creates an inter a system of intermediate courts of appeals. Today we call them circuit courts of appeal. Uh, and uh, it also gave trial courts federal question jurisdiction. Under the original Constitution, people didn't believe that there'd be much in the way of federal trial court work because uh, Article 3 really only gives the United States courts jurisdiction in what's, uh, in what's called, um, uh, well, in, in intrastate uh, disputes, uh, disputes involving uh, uh, the laws of different states uh, that no state court can properly exercise jurisdiction over. And so the idea was that the Supreme, there wouldn't be very many of those kinds of disputes, and such as they were, the Supreme Court could probably handle them just sitting as a trial court. But the Judiciary Act of 1801 gave U.S. Uh, trial courts federal question jurisdiction, which means that any time there's a dispute about the meaning of the law of the United States, U.S. courts hear that case. No state court can hear it. And so the judiciary gets a lot bigger by 1801. Four years into the Constitution, the federal courts have radically expanded. John Adams, the second president of the United States, loses the election of uh, 1800, although it wasn't immediately apparent who the, uh, who the third president of the United States would be because uh, Aaron Burr and Thomas Jefferson tied uh, in the Electoral College, but everybody knew that Adams had lost because he finished a distant third in the, uh, in the selection process, such a distant third that his own partisans and uh, his Federalist partisans in Congress couldn't uh, could not finagle the outcome successfully. But before he left office, Adams had the opportunity to make a number of court appointments. Uh, at the end of his term, the Chief Justiceship of the United States was vacant. Uh, John Jay having left uh, as Chief Justice because he, at least what he told his friends was he was just bored with the job. There wasn't much going on uh, and, uh, and so he, he stepped down to pursue other you know, uh, uh, activities. Uh, so Adams got to choose a new Chief Justice. He chose his Secretary of State. And uh, uh, so that, that would turn out, uh, a fellow named Marshall, that would turn out to be significant. But he also chose a fellow named William Marbury to fill one of those Justice of the Peace jobs in the District of Columbia. It was a close run thing. Uh, we inaugurated presidents back then in March after the Electoral College chose them in December. So as that deadline approached and Adams prepared to leave and it was clear that Jefferson was going to be the next president the House had decided, uh, the, uh, the rush was to fill all of the available judgeships before turning over the presidency uh, to Jefferson. And uh, a, a person for whom I guess, it's, I guess it's fair to say for whom Adams had some ill feeling uh, that grows out, grew out of the election it, uh, itself. Um, so he signed these commissions for judgeships and, uh, and then left the presidency. The problem with Marbury's commission was, although the president had signed it, Marbury had agreed to take the job, uh, 
uh, but uh, the commission itself never got delivered. The reason it didn't get delivered was because President Adams had appointed his Secretary of State, the guy who ordinarily would be responsible for delivering the commission, to become Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. So uh, the result was that Marshall was in the process of moving. Well, if any of you have moved dorm rooms recently, you'll understand that that can be an all-consuming process, at least for a few days. Uh, and so uh, the result was that uh, the commission didn't get uh, delivered. Some of the other commissions didn't get delivered either. Uh, Thomas Jefferson takes the oath of office, uh, comes into the presidency, uh, appoints... Uh, James Madison to be his Secretary of State and Madison uh, informs him that I've got this whole stack of undelivered commissions that have been signed you know by Adams what am I supposed to do with them and Jefferson's instructions were burn them. Uh, I'm the president now and these guys don't work for me and so of course Madison was reluctant to do that, you know, but uh, nevertheless the commissions weren't delivered and it was Jefferson's position that they didn't have to be delivered because their right to the job expired with the Adams administration. Without the commission they'd never officially come to occupy the post and therefore the appointment wasn't complete. So he'd choose his own people. That, that, was, uh, that was Thomas Jefferson's position. That's, uh, that's Marbury. From a, from a painting in the National Gallery. Uh, the, uh, so uh, Marbury sued the Secretary of State, James Madison, asking the Supreme Court to exercise its original jurisdiction under the Judiciary Act of 1789. He wanted a writ of mandamus ordering the Secretary of State to do his job. His job, among other things, to deliver commissions signed by the President. And uh, so that was, uh, that's the, the prequel uh, for Marbury versus Madison. As filed, this was a case about presidential appointment power. And that's the thing that almost nobody understands when they begin to, begin to study it. Because everyone sees the outcome as being a case about judicial review. And it really isn't until the very end a case about judicial review. It's about the limits of presidential appointment power. Uh, to what extent can presidents hire and fire and under what circumstances can they exercise that authority uh, to hire and fire executive officials. These are the two combatants, so to speak, of uh, Marbury versus Madison. It really, isn't a case of, it really isn't a case about Marbury and it really isn't a case about Madison. It's really a case about Thomas Jefferson in the upper left hand corner there also from the National Gallery and Chief Justice Marshall down here in the lower right hand corner also from the National Gallery. Uh, and uh, in their own ways, both fascinating men. I mean, Marshall's one of the few, along with John Jay, one of the few of the early uh, national leaders who actually served in all three branches of government uh, and served until William Runquist came to the job, uh, I thought no one would probably ever serve longer as Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Uh, so he was there for a long time. Uh, Jefferson makes this a constitutional crisis, and that's what makes this case worth studying from our perspective, trying to figure out how to best understand the Constitution. The way Jefferson makes it a crisis is by simply announcing that no matter what the United States Supreme Court decides, he will not comply. This is a question of presidential appointment power, and the United States courts don't have anything to say about it. That was Jefferson's position. So they can rule in favor of Marbury uh, and he is not going to become a judge because I control the appointment process. That's a presidential authority and I'm the president. And if you don't like that, uh, Jefferson said, your remedy is to impeach and remove me. Except my political party controls both chambers of Congress. So good luck with that. And so, uh, Chief Justice Marshall faced quite a conundrum uh, in, in the sense that uh, 
If he challenged Jefferson, it's unlikely uh, that, uh, that the uh, Supreme Court would be able to prevail. Because one of the things that was true about the judiciary at this point in American history was they had no mechanism for enforcement of their decisions. They had to rely on the executive branch to carry out their rulings. And since the executive branch was seemingly hostile uh, to the notion that uh, the president might be wrong uh, in his uh, interpretation, Marshall uh, decided to, uh, that, the, that the Supreme Court had to find another way, sort of through the horns of this dilemma. Um, and he did. What, he, uh, what uh, the United States Supreme Court decided, all Federalists, all of the judges, all Federalists, opposing a Jeffersonian Republican president, uh, what the uh, United States Supreme Court uh, decided uh, in a single opinion, no dissents, no concurrences, just one opinion written by Marshall, was that that part of the Judiciary Act of 1789 that gave the court the power to grant writs of mandamus was unconstitutional. And therefore, they could not possibly give Marbury what he petitioned for. It wasn't a question of whether Jefferson was right or wrong. It was a question of the act itself, that small provision that created the power of the writ of mandamus being unconstitutional. And the reason was simple. It amounted to an amendment to the Constitution. It changed the Article 3, Section 2 jurisdiction of the United States Supreme Court, which should have, Marshall said, required an amendment to the Constitution. But Congress was lazy, and rather than adopting an amendment to the Constitution and sending it to the states for ratification, they had just tucked it in to the Judiciary Act as if it were a thing that Congress could simply do uh, on its own uh, authority. It was a brilliant uh, constitutional analysis, important in its own right, because it settled once and for all the question of wh what are the options when it comes to changing the Constitution. Uh, the, court, uh, the court was clear on its uh, position there. So the, the case itself, though, offers us a glimpse of two conflicting views of the American Constitution that were both in vogue, you know what that means, they were both popular uh, in 1803, just as they're both popular today. Not with the same people, but with lots of people uh, in their own respect. The notion of a fat constitution and the notion of a thin constitution. I choose those words because they're a little easier to remember uh, when it comes to uh, analysis. The fat constitution sees the Constitution as a composite made up of real words written down on paper and lots of additional national government powers that aren't written down but are hidden between the lines. Only judges can find those hidden powers. Some of them uh, are called inherent powers. Some of them are called implied powers. That's just a circumstantial difference, but the point is they're not spelled out anywhere, but they're there sort of looming in the background. But only judges have the special glasses that allow them to see them. And so the cost of, there's much more to the Constitution than appearances suggest the fat constitution analysts argue. The thin constitution analysts, like Jefferson, uh, argue that the text of the Constitution is just a tool. It's not a charter of government. It's just a tool. Uh, and the, it's a tool for, um, for furthering the principles enunciated in the Declaration of Independence. So rather than American government starting with the Constitution, Jefferson says, the Constitution is just a way station on our way to American democracy. It's about a, a vehicle by which we are supposed to implement the real charter of government, which is the Declaration of Independence, which of course Jefferson wrote. And so uh, the rule of law, therefore, does not require judicial supremacy. Judges, there's no way judges should have the final say, or even a say, about the meaning of the charter of government. Uh, 
They have no special equipment for that. They don't have the special spy glasses that let only them see what the Constitution means. Uh, and so their job should be simply settling disputes of law. Ordinary cases. That's what the judiciary is created for, Jefferson said. And that's why there wasn't much detail about it in the Constitution, because it wasn't that important. It was the legislative and executive branches that were important, and that's what the framers spent their time on. Okay, so uh, the thin Constitution's argument then is that vigorous disagreement over the meaning of the principles of democracy. That's what the Declaration of Independence is about. Go back and read it. We don't read it enough anymore, I don't think. Uh, we usually start the story with the, uh, with the Constitution. My, my constitutional law students are always perplexed uh, when we assign the Declaration of Independence first uh, in that uh, class because, of course, there's no case law for the most part associated with the, with the the declaration. But uh, Jefferson and the thin Constitution's point of view is that there are principles enum enumerated in the declaration. They're easy to see. It's like a big list of reasons, you know, for why the, why the, the colonies are separating themselves from, uh, from England. Uh, and uh, those principles, however, are not self-interpreting. That's why you have a constitution. Somebody has to figure out how best to carry out those principles from the Declaration of Independence. That's what the Articles of Confederation was about, was to create a system of government for doing that. It failed, and so they replaced it with a constitution, a new system of government. But the point of the system of government is to interpret the Declaration of Independence, not to create a separate Entity, you know, a separate theoretic entity. The Constitution doesn't make American democracy. The Declaration of Independence does. What the Constitution does is to set up a mechanism for fighting out the disagreements about what the Declaration means. And that's not just a fight for judges. That's a fight for everybody. That's why you have an electoral system with branches of government chosen, you know, in ways designed to represent uh, the wishes of the American people. So the entire American political process, not just the Supreme Court, uh, are and should be the players in the resolution of disputes about the principles established by the Declaration of Independence. So. That's the basis of my contention that Marbury versus Madison is the most widely studied case in constitutional law, but perhaps among the least well understood. The response you usually get from students is, well, it establishes judicial review. Of course, that's wrong. Uh, there were at least three cases decided before 1803 by the United States courts that involved the use of judicial review to declare actions by other governments or other branches of government unconstitutional. If you want one that's easy to read, read Cowpens versus Georgia uh, as, a, as an illustration. Um, among the lessons of Marbury versus Madison is that the meaning of our Constitution was opaque from the very beginning. Opaque means hard to see through. Okay, uh, There was a lot of disagreement among the people in Philadelphia who wrote the Constitution about how it was supposed to connect to the Declaration of Independence. Benjamin Franklin was at the writing of the Constitution, and he was Thomas Jefferson's reader as they went through 55 drafts of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, and he wasn't clear, in his own memoirs he says he wasn't clear, on how exactly the two were supposed to connect uh, by the time they were done with the Constitution. So this disagreement about how best to extract meaning from the Constitution, what is the real meaning of the Constitution and how do we find it, is not new uh, and it is not one that we are close on the track of solving. 